Sleep, Sleep, Sleep Stories, Volume 3, a reading from Mother West Wind Ware Stories, by Thornton W. Burgess, read by Grandpa Beasley. These readings are meant to soothe you to sleepiness. Mother West Wind Ware Stories, by Thornton W. Burgess. Where Grandfather Frog Got His Big Mouth Everybody knows that Grandfather Frog has a big mouth. Of course, it wouldn't be possible to look him straight in the face and not know that he has a big mouth. In fact, about all you see when you look Grandfather Frog full in the face are his great big mouth and two great big googly eyes. He seems then to be all mouth and eyes. Anyway. That is what Peter Rabbit says. Peter never will forget the first time he saw Grandfather Frog. Peter was very young then. He had run away from home to see the great world, and in the course of his wanderings he came to the Smiling Pool. Never before had he seen so much water. The most water he had ever seen before was a little puddle in the lone little path. So when Peter, who was only half grown then, hopped out on the bank of the smiling pool and saw it dimpling and smiling in the sunshine, he thought it the most wonderful thing he had ever seen. The truth is that in those days Peter was in the habit of thinking everything he saw for the first time the most wonderful thing yet. And as he was continually seeing new things, and as his eyes always nearly popped out of his head whenever he saw something new, it is a wonder that he didn't become pop-eyed. Peter stared and stared at the smiling pool, and little by little, he began to see other things. First, he noticed the bulrushes growing with their feet in the water. They looked to him like giant grass, and he began to be a little fearful lest this should prove to be a sort of magic place, a place of giants. Then he noticed the lily pads, and he stared very hard at these. They looked like growing things, and yet they seemed to be floating right on top of the water. It wasn't until a merry little breeze came along and turned the edge of one up so that Peter saw the long stem running down in the water out of sight that he was able to understand how these lily pads could be growing there. He was still staring at those lily pads when a great deep voice said, Chuggerum, chuggerum, don't you know it isn't polite to stare at people? That voice was so unexpected and so deep that Peter was startled. He jumped, started to run, then stopped. He wanted to run, but curiosity wouldn't let him. He simply couldn't run away until he had found out where that voice came from and to whom it belonged. It seemed to Peter that it had come from right out of the smiling pool. But look as he would, he couldn't see anyone there. If you please, said Peter timidly, I'm not staring at anybody. All the time he was staring down into the smiling pool with eyes fairly popping out of his head. Chuggerum, have a care, young fellow. Have a care how you talk to your elders. Do you mean to be impudent enough to tell me to my face that I am not anybody? The voice was deeper and gruffer than ever, and it made Peter more uncomfortable than ever. Oh, no, sir, no, indeed exclaimed Peter. I don't mean anything of the kind. I, I, well, if you please, sir, I don't see you at all, so how can I be staring at you? I'm sure from the sound of your voice that you must be somebody very important. Please excuse me for seeming to stare. I was just looking for you. That is all. A little movement in the water close to a big green lily pad caught Peter's eyes, and then out on the big green lily pad climbed Grandfather Frog. If Peter had stared before, he doubly stared now, eyes and mouth wide open. Grandfather Frog was looking his very best, in his handsome green coat and white and yellow waistcoat. But Peter had hardly noticed these at all. Why, you're all mouth, he exclaimed, and then looked very much ashamed of his impoliteness. Grandfather Frog's great googly eyes twinkled. He knew that Peter was very young and innocent and just starting out in the world. He knew that Peter didn't intend to be impolite. Not quite, said he good-naturedly. Not quite all mouth. 
though I must admit that it is of a good size. The fact is, I wouldn't have it a bit smaller if I could. If it were any smaller, I should miss many a good meal. And if I were forced to do that, I am afraid I should be very ill-tempered indeed. The truth is, I am very proud of my big mouth. I don't know of anyone who has a bigger one for their size. He opened his mouth wide, and it seemed to Peter that Grandfather Frog's whole head simply split in halves. He hadn't supposed anybody in all the great world possessed such a mouth. Where did you get it? gasped Peter, and then felt that he had asked a very foolish question. Grandfather Frog chuckled. I got it from my father, and he got it from his father, and so on, way back to the days when the world was young and the frogs ruled the world, said he. Would you like to hear about it? I'd love to, cried Peter. So he settled himself comfortably on the bank of the Smiling Pool for the first of many, many stories he was to hear from Grandfather Frog. Chugarum, began Grandfather Frog. You know, he always begins a story that way. Chugarum, once upon a time, the great world was mostly water, and most of the people lived in the water. It was in those days that my great, great, ever so great grandfather lived. Those were happy days for the frogs. Yes, indeed, those were happy days for the frogs. Of course, they had enemies, but those enemies were all in the water. They didn't have to be watching out for danger from the air and from the land, as I do now. There was plenty to eat and little to do, and the frog tribe increased very fast. In fact, the frogs increased so fast that after a while there wasn't plenty to eat. That is, there wasn't plenty of the kind of food they had been used to, which was mostly water plants and water bugs and such things. Of course, there were many fish, and these also increased very fast, and the big fish ate the frogs whenever they could catch them, just as they do to this day. The big fish also ate the little fish, and it wasn't long before the frogs and the little fish took to living where the water was not deep enough for the big fish to swim. And this made it all the harder to get enough to eat. The mouths of the frogs in those days were not big. In fact, they were quite small. You see, living on the kind of food they did, they had no need of big mouths. One day, as great, great, ever so great Grandfather Frog sat with just his head out of the water, wondering what it would seem like to have his stomach really filled, a school of little fish came swimming about him, and it popped into his head that if little fish were good for big fish to eat, they might be good for a frog to eat. So he caught the first one that came within reach, and he found it was good to eat. He liked it so well that after that he caught fish whenever he could. Of course he swallowed them whole. He had to, because he had no chewing or biting teeth. Now the frogs always have been famous for their appetites. And Great Grandfather Frog found that it took a great many of these teeny weeny fish to make a comfortable meal. He was thinking of this one day when a larger fish came within reach, and almost without realizing what he was doing, Great Grandfather snapped at and caught him. He caught that fish by the tail and at once began to swallow it, which of course was no way to swallow a fish. But Great Grandfather Frog had much to learn in those days. And so he tried to swallow that fish tail first instead of head first. He got the tail down in the smallest part of the body, and then that fish stuck. Yes, sir, that fish stuck. The fact was, Great Grandfather Frog's mouth wasn't wide enough. It was bad enough not to be able to swallow all of that fish, but what was worse was the discovery that he couldn't get up again what he had swallowed. That fish was stuck. It would go neither down nor up. Poor great-grandfather Frog was in a terrible fix. Big tears rolled down his cheeks. He choked and choked and choked until it looked very much as if he might choke to death. Just in time, in the very nick of time, who should come along but old Mother Nature? She saw right away what the trouble was, and she pulled out the fish. Then she asked how that fish had happened to be in such a place as Great Grandfather Frog's mouth. When he could get his breath, he told her all about it, how food had been getting scarce, and how he had discovered that fish were good to eat, 
in how he had made a mistake in catching a fish too big for his mouth. Old Mother Nature looked thoughtful. She saw the great numbers of young fish. Suddenly she reached over and put a finger in Great Grandfather Frog's mouth and stretched it sideways. Then she did the same thing to the other corner. Great Grandfather Frog's mouth was three times as big as it had been before. Now, said she, I don't believe you'll have any more trouble, and I'm going to do the same thing for all the other frogs. She did that very day, and from then on the frogs no longer had any trouble in getting plenty to eat. So that is where I got my big mouth, and I tell you right now, I wouldn't trade it for anything anybody else has got, concluded Grandfather Frog, as he snapped up a foolish green fly who came too near. I think it is splendid, perfectly splendid, cried Peter. I wish I had one just like it. And then he wondered why Grandfather Frog laughed so hard. Where Miser the Trade Rat First Set Up Shop It was quite by accident that Peter Rabbit first heard of Miser the Trade Rat. You know how it is with Peter. He is forever using those big ears of his to learn interesting things. That is what ears are for, but there is a right way and a wrong way to use them, and I am afraid that Peter isn't always over-particular in this respect. I suspect, in fact, I know that Peter sometimes listens when he has no business to listen and knows he has no business to listen. Again, he sometimes overhears things quite by accident when he cannot very well help hearing. It was in this way that he first heard of Miser, the trade rat. Peter had crept into a hollow log in the green forest to rest and to feel absolutely safe while he was doing it. He had been there only a little while when he heard light footsteps outside and a moment later a voice which made him shiver a little in spite of himself and the knowledge that he was perfectly safe. The footsteps and the voice were old man coyotes. Very carefully Peter peeped out. Old man coyote had sat down close by the log in which Peter was hiding. On a dead tree close at hand sat old Mr. Buzzard who had come up from way down south for the summer. And it was to him that Old Man Coyote was talking. I was over by Farmer Brown's barn last night, said Old Man Coyote, and I caught a glimpse of Robert, the brown rat. What a disgrace he is to the whole rat tribe. For that matter, he is a disgrace to all who live in the green meadows and in the green forest. He isn't much like his cousin, Miser, the trade rat. My goodness, do you know Miser? exclaimed old Mr. Buzzard. Do I know Miser? I should say I do, replied old man Coyote. I've tried to catch him enough times to know him. He kept a junk shop very near where I used to live, way out west. Do you know him, Mr. Buzzard? I certainly does, chuckled old Mr. Buzzard. I certainly does. I never did see such a busy fellow as he is. I done see his junk shop many times, and always it done be growing bigger. I wonder, Br'er Coyote, if you ever heard the story of his great, great, ever so great granddaddy, the first of the family, and how and where he started the business that's been kept in the family ever since. No, said Old Man Coyote, I never did, and I've wondered about it a great deal. Peter Rabbit almost forgot that he was hiding. He was so eager to hear that story that he was right on the point of speaking up and begging old Mr. Buzzard to tell it when he remembered old man Coyote. Just in the nick of time, he clamped a hand over his mouth. It seemed to Peter a long, long time before old man Coyote said, I'd like to hear that story, Mr. Buzzard, if it isn't too much to ask of you. Not at all, Br'er Coyote, not at all. I'll be more than pleased to tell it to you. I certainly will, said old Mr. Buzzard and Peter settled himself comfortably to listen. You see, it was this way, began old Mr. Buzzard. I got it from my granddaddy, and he got it from his granddaddy, and his granddaddy got it from... I know, interrupted old man Coyote. It was handed down from your greatest great-grandfather who lived in the days when the world was young, and what you were going to tell me about happened. Isn't that it? Yes, sir, replied old Mr. Buzzard. Yes, sir, that's it. Old Mother Nature treat them all alike in those days. 
She's a real smart, busy person, and she ain't got no time for to answer foolish questions. No, sir, she ain't. So, quick as she got a new kind of critter made, she turn him loose and tell him if he want to live, he got to be right smart and find out for hisself how to do it. I reckon yo know all about that, Br'er Coyote. Old Man Coyote nodded, and old Mr. Buzzard scratched his bald head gently, as if trying to stir up his memory. Peter Rabbit almost squealed aloud in his impatience while he waited for old Mr. Buzzard to go on. When old Mother Nature made Br'er Trade Rat in the beginning and turned him loose in the great world, he was just plain Mr. Rat, and nothing more, same as his no-count cousin, Robber the Brown Rat, continued old Mr. Buzzard. He had a winner name for himself, same as everybody else. He had mighty sharp wits, had this Mr. Rat, and directly he found he had to shift for himself, he began to study, and study, and study what he gwine to do to live well and be happy. He watched his neighbors to see what they did, and it didn't take him long to find out that if he would be respected, he must have a home. Those without homes were mostly no-count folks, same as they are today. So Br'er Rat made a nest close to the trunk of a tree on the edge of the green forest. A soft, warm nest, and in collecting the stuff to make it of, he learned the joy of being busy. Personally, you understand, I think he was all wrong. I never am so happy as when I can take a sunbath with nothing to do. But Br'er Rat was never so happy as when he was busy. And when he got that little nest finished, time began to hang heavy on his hands. Yes, sir, it certainly did. Just because he didn't have anything else to do, he began to add a little more to his house. One day, he stepped on a thorn. Ouch! cried Br'er Rat, and then right away forgot the pain in a new idea. He would cover his house with thorns, leaving just a little secret entrance for himself. Then he would be safe, wholly safe, from his big neighbors, some of whom had begun to look at him with such a hungry look in their eyes that they made him right smart uncomfortable. So he spent his time, did Br'er Rat, in hunting for the longest and sharpest thorns, and in cutting the branches on which they grew. These he carried to his house, and piled them around it and on it, until it had become a great pile with sharp thorns sticking out in every direction. And the hungriest of the big people of the forest passed it at a respectful distance. When Br'er Rat had all the thorns he needed and more, he began to collect other things, and added these to his pile. You see, he had found that it was great fun to collect things, to find the queerest things he could, and bring them home and look at them and wonder about them. So little by little, his house became a sort of junk shop, the very first one in all the great world. Bright stones and shells, bones, anything that caught his bright eyes and pleased them, he brought home. When he was tired of hunting for food or more strange things, he would sit and gloat over his treasures and play with them. And then the first thing he knew, he had a name. Yes, sir, he had a name. He was called Miser. Of course, Br'er Miser hadn't lived very long before he found out that one law of the great world was that things belonged to whoever could get them and keep them. He saw that some thought themselves very smart when they stole from their neighbors. Br'er Miser didn't like this at all. He was very, very honest, was Br'er Miser. Perhaps he wasn't really much tempted, not for a long time anyway. But at last came a time when he was tempted. Quite by accident he found one of Mr. Squirrel's storehouses. In it were some nuts different from any he had ever seen before. Br'er Squirrel won't mind if I taste just one, said he, and did it. It tasted good. It tasted very good indeed. Br'er Miser began to wish he had some nuts like those. When he got home, he couldn't think of anything but how good those nuts tasted. He knew that all he had to do was to watch until Br'er Squirrel was away and then go help himself. He knew that was just what any of his neighbors would do in his place. But Br'er Miser couldn't make it seem just right any way he looked at it. He was too honest, was Br'er Miser, to do anything like that. He was sitting, staring at his treasures, but thinking about those nuts, when an idea popped into his head, an idea that made him smile until I reckons he must split his cheeks. I know what I'll do, said he. I'll just help myself to some of those nuts, and I'll leave something of mine in place of them. That's what I'll do. 
and that's what he did do. He picked out a bright shell of which he was very fond, and he left it in Br'er Squirrel's storehouse to pay for the nuts that he took. After that, he always helped himself to anything he wanted, but he always left something to pay for it. It wasn't long before his neighbors found out what he was doing, and then they called him Miser the Trade Rat. Whenever anybody found something he didn't want himself, he took it to the little junk shop of Miser the Trade Rat and traded it for something else, or left it where Miser would find it, knowing that Miser would leave something in its place. And it's been just so with Miser's family ever since. There is one rat who was a credit to his family instead of a disgrace, concluded old Mr. Buzzard. The End <laughs>